Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Stephen McLeod, and I'm the director of library programs here at Mount Vernon. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Ford Motor Company specifically for underwriting this very popular series, uh, and more broadly for their generous support of Mount Vernon over many, many years. Uh, and now for the introduction of tonight's speaker, who's not our typical academic professor type historian. Uh, Patrick K. O'Donnell is a combat historian, author, and public speaker who's also an expert on elite and special operations units in irregular warfare. Patrick has experienced combat firsthand. He was the only civilian combat historian to volunteer and spend three months in Iraq documenting the experiences of the troops. And he fought with a Marine rifle platoon during the Battle of Fallujah. He also served as a war correspondent for Men's Journal and Fox News during his second tour of Iraq. He's the author of no less than 10 books that recount stories of America's wars, including First Seals, the untold story of the forging of America's most elite unit, uh, Into the Rising Sun, World War II's Pacific veterans reveal the heart of combat. We were one, shoulder to shoulder with the Marines who took Fallujah, and his bestseller, Beyond Valor, World War II's Rangers and Airborne Veterans Revealed the Heart of Combat, which won, which won the William E. Colby Award for Outstanding Military History. Patrick is an expert on the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which many of us know uh, was America's Special Operations Forces during World War II and is, uh, was the forerunner of the CIA. He has assisted with writing and production of numerous documentaries for the BBC, the History Channel, Discovery, and more. He also provided consultation for the popular HBO miniseries, Band of Brothers. Patrick joins us tonight to discuss his latest book, Washington's Immortals, the untold story of an elite regiment who changed the course of the revolution. So please join me in a warm Mount Vernon welcome for Patrick K. O'Donnell. Fallujah asked me what you want to do tonight, Pat. Do you want to see the Met or do you want to, what do you want to do? And I said, let's go visit the Battle of Brooklyn. I had done some research prior to that and we decided to meet it's where now is Greenwood Cemetery at the front gate where the battle begins. This is the largest battle of the, of the Revolutionary War, which interestingly enough begins at the Red Lion Inn, which is no longer there, obviously, but there was a watermelon patch during the American Revolution, and both sides skirmished the night of, of August 27, 1776. Uh, 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 and it's there that this battle begins. And we walked up and down Battle Hill, in and around the alleys of Brooklyn, and we found an old stone house, which is one of the great small unit engagements in American history that nobody knows about. It's here that the Marylanders charged several times into this stone house that was occupied by Cornwallis and allowed the bulk of the American army to escape that, were, that was on Guanas Heights back into their fortifications in Brooklyn Heights. We then walked down uh, several blocks and found a rusted old sign that said, here lie 256 Continental soldiers, Maryland heroes, somewhere up in Brooklyn, under a street corner or in an empty lot are the bodies of these men. And I became obsessed with finding out where they're buried and the story behind that sign. And it, it's been a long journey. It took me six years uh, of painstaking research to put together their story, which begins on a wintry night in December 1774, where men of honor, family, and fortune formed the first independent company, the Baltimore Independent Cadets. This is an incredible story where these men had risked their lives and fortunes and were all traitors to the crown. They signed a compact and a contract that they would within 48 hours notice go to any of their sister colonies 
to protect and defend them. At this time, Boston Harbor was under blockade by the British. And these men took it upon themselves to try to change history. And they were all traitors at the time. And the penalty for, for, being a, for, for treason at the time was being drawn and quartered and having your, your intestines ripped out and burned in front of you. The Crown did not, um, I mean, they were merciless to people that, that betrayed them. And, and they had basically put down pretty much every insurrection that they had at this time prior to that. And these men, 60 of them, formed this first unit. And it's the Baltimore Independent Cadets. The main character of this book is uh, Major Mordecai Gist. He, along with Samuel Smith and other men, formed this small company. And they, they sign their names. They also begin to train. They, they, they pledge their fortunes. They buy the best weapons that money can buy. They outfit them with the best uh, uniforms and accoutrements. They begin to train and drill. They have their own uh, drill ma ma master, Richard Carey, who had prior to that been in a, um, a Massachusetts, Massachusetts militia unit about 20 years earlier. He trained and drilled these men. And it caught, at the time, the attention of Baltimore City and the residents there. And as they're, tr they're, they're drilling and training, they, the, uh, an anonymous, I think, one of the most extraordinary pieces of, of research that I found was in the Gist papers. And it was a letter from an, an anonymous source. It was signed Agamemnon. And it said that in, this, is, this was written in March 1775. This is over a year prior to the Battle of Brooklyn that these men would become American Spartans, and they would face an enemy of over 20,000. And it's a prophetic letter. And this is, this is exactly what happens that these men, um, they perform an incredible duty against all odds. And as they train and drill, Maryland is unique in the colonies in the sense that it, it forms a unit for self-protection as well as the continent. And they form what's known as Smallwood's Battalion under Colonel uh, William Smallwood. And Gist's unit is subsumed into this, along with other independent units. And it becomes a battalion of nearly 1,000 men. And they train and drill. And they're, one of their first um, combats, or sense of combat, if you will, is where Lord Dunmore sends a fleet, a small flotilla of ships towards Baltimore and Annapolis with the intent of potentially burning them down. And the cadets are, along with Smallwood's battalion, is mobilized. And they don't have enough men to, to guard against Dunmore's fleet. So they do an interesting thing. They actually line up along the shore with all their men to demonstrate their military might, which isn't much. And then they do it again and again, every mile as the ship goes by, <laughs> to demonstrate how strong they are. And it, it works. The, the, the fleet doesn't uh, raid Baltimore and Annapolis. And it's, but it's th their first real taste of combat begins on the night of August 27, 1776, where Major Gist, who's the executive officer or the second in command, is the right term, of, of, the, of Smallwood's battalion, is in charge. Because Smallwood at the time is in a court-martial at General Washington's behest in Manhattan. And the unit is, is based in or around near Brooklyn Heights, where the Stone House is today. And they, they're basically what happens is there's, there's a small arms fire. And there's a, the, basically, the men are um, called to arms. And they march off towards where, what is now Greenwood Cemetery, the high ground there. And they form a order of battle. And they withstand um, several rounds of combat against General Grant. And at the time, this is a large kind of hammer and anvil kind of exercise. And what I mean by that is they face the demonstration force, which is about 10,000 troops under General Grant. And w meanwhile, several, many, many thousands of troops under Clinton, Cornwallis, and General Howe go through an unguarded pass and flank the, the Marylanders and the American defenses on Guanas Heights. And what happens is 
as the Marylanders withstand volley after volley, cannonade after cannonade, you know, men are losing their arms and heads, they still stand in formation and they also fire back on the British, but they suddenly realize that they're being flanked and they have to make a, a, a dash for their lives and they have to fight through the British to get back towards the stone house. And it's here, um, after several interesting small engagements, that they, um, they encounter many British along the way. British actually, there's, a, there's one engagement that's recounted by Samuel Smith as well as Gist, where the British actually attempt to, to surrender, but it's all a ruse. They take their muskets, turn them upside down in what was the convention at the time to surrender, but it was just a ruse and they opened fire on the Marylanders as they get closer. The Marylanders are able to, to basically fight through that, get back towards the stone house, and this is here where Lord Sterling organizes the Marylanders, which is a, roughly about five companies of men. We don't know the exact numbers, but they are organized and they, they charge several times into this house, which is occupied by Cornwallis, who has several light cannon in the house. And these men have to withstand canister and grape, as well as musket fire. And canister and grape, for those that have never heard, it's, it's got like a squeaking sound. It's a giant sawed-off shotgun where massive um, lead balls um, are coming at these men and, and they're shredding uh, you know, arms and legs. I mean, these men are literally, as Walt Whitman said, the, the flower of the South is reduced to atoms as many of these men charge into this house. But they do it multiple times. They close ranks, they go over the bodies of the men, and they continue to charge, and they make the opening that allows the bulk of the army, which is on Guanas Heights, to, to, re, to retreat back to the fortifications in Brooklyn Heights. And it's, and it's an incredible story. And it's the Marylanders in Gist who escapes that day, along with several other of his men and Samuel Smith, and they make it back towards the forts. And it's, this is a point in the revolution where had the British attacked that day, they might have con the, the war might have been over. They might have been able to destroy the, the American army. They might have been able to capture Washington. But a strange series of events then takes place the, that following day where a massive nor'easter pelts the line both lines, and uh, how build siege trenches around the American defenses at, at Brooklyn, and they move their way closer, but they're not able to. The, the rain basically prevents both armies from fighting. And it's here that Washington makes the epic decision to, to retreat. And it's one of the great retreats in all, um, all military history across the East River where John Glover's Marblehead men come in, they bring all the boats that they can in Manhattan, and they evacuate Washington's army. And once again, though, it's the Marylanders that are the rear guard. Samuel Smith and his men are literally the last men to get on the boats. And they didn't, they didn't even realize that they were, um, they were, they were actually moving out. And they, he runs across, there's an incredible story of how he runs across Washington, who's also some of the, the last, uh, one of the last men, nearly one of the last men on the boats also. And the Marylanders cross um, the East River with the army. And about two weeks later, it's the Marylanders again that are called upon. At Kipps Bay, the British land, and near Murray Hill, the entire American army practically disintegrates. And there's an incredible story of how Washington is in the front lines and he's vexed. He basically, is, he basically freezes. He's only, there's only, you're only about 500 yards from the British Army or so, maybe even closer, and he, and he freezes, and his men have to bring his horse off the, off the field of battle to help him escape. And um, the Marylanders, though, are there to allow the army to, to make their way back to the fortifications at Harlem Heights. They make a stand at a place called McGowan's Pass. This is um, now Central Park, uh, where, they're, where they're making the stand. Um, and they hold long enough for the army to withdraw, but you're you'll start you're starting to see a pattern. This is a um, an ar this is a unit that's called upon time and time again by Washington, and they're called upon at Harlem Heights, and they're called upon at White Plains, and tragically, many Marylanders. There's there's several companies of Marylanders that are in a massive fortification in November in 1776 
known as Fort Washington. And for those that you know that we're the, um, the pillar of the George Washington Bridge on the Manhattan side, that was once one of the great forts of the Revolution. This thing spanned over, over a mile with redoubts and, and, and um, fortifications. And it's one of the great tragic stories of the American Revolution where the adjutant of the fort had, led, had fled about a week before the actual assault or siege by the British with the plans and the order of battle. And he delivered that up to the British, who then surrounded the fort in, August, in, in November and assaulted it. And the Marylanders, under Otho Holland Williams, a great, one of the great band of brothers in this book, you know, hold out against all odds for many, many hours. But the fort is captured. And perhaps the luckiest Marylander in the revolution escapes that day. Um, and what I mean by that is he found a rowboat along with several other men. Lawrence Everhart was able to escape Fort Washington, row across the Hudson River, and land at what's now Fort Lee. And here he encounters Washington. And this book is very unique in the sense that it's not a regimental history. It's a band of brothers type history. It's a it's a story about those in their, the voices of those that were there in their own words. And it's through their own words, but what I mean by that is I utilize pension files and pension applications, including Lawrence Everhart's, who described what he saw that day in his own words. He talked about how he saw Washington with a spyglass looking across the Hudson looking across the ruins of Fort Washington and seeing his men going through a gauntlet, literally a gauntlet, where the British and Hessian soldiers lined up and marched the prisoners through the gauntlet as they kicked and beat them. Several, many of them were bayoneted. Their possessions were stolen. And Everhart describes the scene. He says that he saw Washington with tears in his eyes. And that's kind of the, the book that I wanted to... Well, that's what Washington Immortals captures. It's sort of the heart and soul and the hidden war of the revolution in the words of those who, there, who were there. And much of this book is based on pension files and pension applications. And what I mean by that, for those, that you, for, for those of you who are not familiar with what that term means, is if you were lucky enough to survive the American Revolution in 1820 or so, you could go down to the local courthouse and swear under oath what you did and saw during the American Revolution to a judge. And it's, it, these are the accounts that survive today. They're in, the, they're in the National Archives. They're now also in a place called Fold 3, which you can access online. But it's these statements that provide sort of a hidden war into the revolution. And it's, uh, it can be everything from, OK, I was at the Battle of Trenton, or I was at Fort Washington. I, my officers included Otho Holland Williams and several others. But it's also sometimes very detailed accounts, like Lawrence Everhart. And many of these applications have never been published. Uh, many of them are published for the first time in, in Washington's Immortals. And it's after Fort Washington that the, the Marylanders, along with the Delaware Blues, I cover in this book, the Delaware Blues as well as the Marylanders, because they fight side by side constantly. They um, are once again called upon to be the rear guard. As Washington, as Fort Lee falls, um, Washington's army is pushed through New Jersey, and their plan is to make their way to the safety of the Delaware River in Pennsylvania, where there are many um, patriots and many patriot farms that can supply the army. Much of northern New Jersey at this time is Loyalist territory, so Washington has to pull out to find um, a safe haven. And they, they make their way um, across New Jersey, it's sort of an epic story, where the army is, you know, at one point was 18,000 or more, is now reduced to several thousand men. And they're in rags, they're, they're you know, after this constant fighting, many of the men are, don't have shoes. And they, they make their way and they stagger their way towards the Delaware River. And the, the, the immortals are in the rear guard um, 
felling trees at, at times and also skirmishing. And um, as the army makes its way towards the Delaware River, one of the, my favorite scenes in the book is from Charles Wilson Peel. The, um, the book has one of the Marylanders is James Peel, his brother. And James was an ensign. And an ensign during the American Revolution often carried the, the regimental colors of the company. And um, James uh, was, the ens was one of the ensigns in the unit. And um, Charles Wilson Peel had not seen his brother for, for nearly a year. But as he was at the crossing of the Delaware, he described how it was a hellish scene where there were bonfires as the men were crossing the river in rafts and boats, and a figure kind of stumbles forward that has uh, warts and his face is covered with, with, um, with dirt and grime. He's in rags, and it's only when he's in front of him that he realizes that it's his brother James. That's the condition of these men at the time. And the army is, is literally falling apart. The Washington's Immortals, perhaps some of the more compelling chapters in this book are about the 10 crucial days where America was, was nearly didn't exist. It's, it's in this time frame in December 1776 where the, are the dark, some of the darkest days of, of this country where the enlistments at the time are all expiring. Many of the Marylanders who are, you know, they initially start out as an 800 man unit or more are down to about 150. That's through battlefield casualties as well as sickness, et cetera. Their, their enlistments are all expiring. And it's here that Washington rallies the men and asks them to serve their country for one more month. It's a time that you can serve your country like no other. And he, you know, one man steps forward and several others do. And many of the Marylanders stay of, of, of that group, about 150 men stay, including Gist and several others. And they make the epic crossing at Trenton. I mean, at Trenton, it, the Trenton is a, um, is a turning point in, in, in some ways, in that, for that time period at least, where they're able to capture Johann Rawls, a uh, large part of his, his uh, the Hessian garrison there. They, um, they, they re, you know, they recrossed the river, which is actually in some cases more perilous than the initial crossing because they found large quantities of rum. And it, <laughs> this is a drunken crossing. Several men fall, actually literally fall into the river. And um, Washington thinks everything is fine until he finds out that John Cal Head Walliter, who's part of the Philadelphia Associators, a militia unit based in Philadelphia, founded by Benjamin Franklin, crossed the river the next day. And he now has a dilemma on his hands. What does he do? Does he call, recall Cadwallader or reinforce? And he decides to reinforce Cadwallader and recross the Delaware River. And they set up back in Trenton. But instead of setting up in the town itself, they set up behind what's known as Assunpeak Creek on the eastern side of Trenton. And it's one of the great, it sets up one of the great great um, unknown, untold, or unreported battles, I think, of the American Revolution. That's the second battle of, of Trenton, or the Battle of Assunpink Creek, where Cornwallis finds out that, that Washington has recrossed, and then fights his way from um, near New Brunswick back down towards Trenton. He has to face Edward Hand's Sharpshooters along the way, their, their numbers are thinned down, the British numbers are thinned down, but they reach the bridge that afternoon and they make a number, a series of epic, epic assaults. There's, the, there's a stone bridge, the, one of the only crossings of the Assunpeak Creek. And it's here that we see Washington's leadership once again. His horse is actually literally pressed against the wooden beam of one of the, uh, on one side of the bridge as he directs his men to hold off some of the best units in the, in the British Army, some of the light infantry and the assault troops that try to cross the bridge. They try to cross three or four times, and they're stopped by Marylanders, which are in, in the Delaware Blues, which are not far from, the, from, from Washington, as well as the Virginians and many other units. And it's one of these epic 
epic small unit engagements, much like the, the Marylanders first um, series of, of bayonet charges at the beginning of the war. And the bridge is a, it's a, it's an incredible uh, piece of real estate actually that the stone, the original stones of that bridge are still there. It's, it's been built over by several other structures, but that those stones are still there. And what I found in striking is that many of the battle, our battlefields in Trenton and other places in Long Island aren't even preserved. There's not even interpretive signs on what happened at one of the, one of the most important inflection points in the American Revolution. And it's one of the reasons why I wrote this book, to bring awareness to the story and to get people involved in, in the American Revolution. And it's here that Washington, um, after Assunpink Creek, makes a bold decision. He strikes north towards Princeton, where there's a small Brit uh, British garrison. Instead of recrossing the Delaware, which is fraught with peril, they go north, they attack Princeton, and it's the Marylanders that are in the van once again. They lead one of the forces up the road, and um, they encounter um, the British regiment and uh, the lead elements, the Marylanders included, are initially pushed back by the British, who mount a series of charges themselves, quite heroically. And the army is in flight. And once again, Washington, in his battlefield presence, rallies the troops and, and, and pushes the army forward. And they're, they're victorious. The, the goal is to take this war chest in New Brunswick, where there's reportedly 70,000 uh, pounds, which is a, a massive fortune at the time. But the men are too exhausted, and they, they move off into, um, into high ground for the, for the winter. And I could sort of recount this, the Marylander story, which spans not only the north, but also the south, and all of the major engagements in the south, beginning with Camden, Cowpens, Guilford Courthouse, Pretty much nearly every major battle these men are involved in. But this book is different. It's a, it's a Band of Brothers style treatment of the American Revolution. And what I mean by that is it covers the main officers and enlisted men and their stories throughout the entire war. And let me give you a couple examples of, of some of the men that are in this book. One is Nathaniel Ramsey. And Nathaniel Ramsey is a, one of the old men of the unit. This is a war that's fought by 20-somethings. Most of the men in the Maryland line are in their 20s. Ramsey's 33. He's a lawyer from Cecil County, Maryland. And he's a politician. But he's also a, um, he goes in as a, a captain and a, has a company. In Long Island, or at Brooklyn, I should say, he's at the Stone House. And he's one of the few survivors. He's tall. He's over six feet tall. And that is a, an asset, because there's a mill pond in, near the stone house. And many of the men have to cross this mill pond in order to survive. He's able to swim, or, uh, he's able to swim, but he's able to actually, he's tall enough that he's able to walk on the bottom of the mill pond with his head barely above the water. And he assists several men to make their way across. And Ramsey um, continues to fight. And I think what's interesting about the Immortals, it's not just about the men of the war. It's about the women of the war and some extraordinary women like Jenny Ramsey, his wife. Jenny is a, um, it's, I don't mean this as a derogatory wor word, but she's a camp follower. She follows her husband. She marches with the army. And she doesn't just march. They have a, a covered wagon. And they move with the army. And, and Mrs. Ramsey is an extraordinary woman, a beautiful woman. And when she sets up camp, the men of the Maryland line, this is the epicenter of, of camp life for the Maryland line. They trade stories. They talk. It's her cooking, etc. And she stays with, with her husband and, um, it, and through, this, through the, um, you know, some of the most difficult days with the army. And um, I think the Mrs. Ramsey story and, and Nathaniel's Ramsey story, the anniversary of, that, of one of their great moments was last week. 
at a place called Mammoth Courthouse. And it's Mammoth is Nathaniel Ramsey at the time was in charge of the 3rd Maryland Regiment. The, the Maryland Regiments had actually grown from the small Baltimore Independent Cadets to multiple regiments. But it was the DNA, the leadership tissue that was in the, the Baltimore Independent Cadets that kept everything together, including men like Ramsey. And Ramsey's leadership was called upon in an infl a great inflection point during the revolution at Monmouth Courthouse. The Marylanders were advancing with Washington's army and a small corps, or a corps group under Charles Lee was directed to, to attack the retreating British army from Philadelphia. And the, the, the baggage train was many, many miles long for the British Army as they, they retreated out of Philadelphia through New Jersey towards ships at Sandy Hook. And the, the armies meet at Freehold, New Jersey or at Monmouth Courthouse on a 100 degree day. And Charles Lee's in charge and uh, it's a disaster. Uh, the, uh, the army attacks under Lee and some of the best units in the British Army are put in the back because they anticipate that this is exactly what's going to happen. And Lee is, is surprised. He's in full retreat. And he meets Washington on the field. And General Charles Scott recalls the moment where he says, you know, George Washington is a stoic figure. But it's here that he says that the leaves literally shake on the trees as Washington is swearing up and down at Lee and dismissing him off the field. And he calls upon Ramsey. He says, give me give me a little bit of time to bring up the rest of the army if you can hold. And Ramsey charges the 3rd Maryland into the vortex of battle and holds. He checks parts of the British army and um, you know it's an epic sort of it's small unit action in this microcosm of, of this action. Ramsey is nearly killed by his British counterpart and he's about to be slain and according to legend, there's several accounts of how he actually survived. But it, one, uh, one of the accounts says that Ramsey revealed his Masonic ring to the officer. <laughs> and he was granted quarter. <laughs> and what's, what's interesting and extraordinary about this account is that Mrs. Ramsey joined her husband in captivity. She went to New York City with her husband. They were paroled. They purchased a home, and they lived throughout the rest of the war in New York City. This is not the typical story of what happens if you were a captured Continental soldier with no money. You typically would be rotting in a prison ship in New York Harbor. And that's exactly what happened to one of my other band of brothers, Jack Stewart. And Jack Stewart was close friends with Nathaniel Ramsey. And he was also close friends with Samuel Smith. In fact, they were mortal enemies. Stewart and Smith actually had a duel right before the war. And then they became close friends after the duel. And um, Stewart is a man of... Um, He's about 20-something years old. He's over six feet tall, muscular. His motto in life was, you only live once. And he was extremely reckless and daring and brave. And um, on several encounters, he was at the Battle of Brooklyn. He actually brought up several cannon to support Nathaniel Ramsey and Mordecai Gist as they were retreating and survived that engagement and survived many of the other engagements. He was court-martialed in New York around the Battle of Harlem for striking um, a British enlisted man. He was exonerated. Um, but Jack Stewart is captured in a forgotten raid at Staten Island along with many of the other Marylanders. And he's, he's rotting on a British hell ship in New York Harbor. And to sort of give you a a feel for what this is like. These are floating concentration camps. Most people don't come by off alive. Upwards of 18,000 Americans died on these hell ships. And Jack Stewart was almost one of them. 
But we find out, we're not exactly sure what the story is, but Jack Stewart escapes. And it's, it's thought that his close friend, Samuel Smith or Nathaniel Ramsey, provided him the money to bribe some of the guards to get off the ship and, and escape. He joins up with the Marylanders again at a place called Mud Island. And Mud Island is right outside of where now the Philadelphia airport's at in the Schuylkill River. And it was a, a fortification that was built prior to the war to guard Philadelphia. And it's an incredible siege that goes on for over 40 days. And this, the, the fort in Mud Island is, is manned by Samuel Smith, Jack Stewart's close friend. And, they, and the Marylanders are there. They, they, they basically um, withstand one of the great bombardments of the war. Smith is a man of action and actually literally sallies out of the fort with an, an amphibious landing and then takes out, spikes several gun positions near the fort, destroys them. And um, they're able to withstand the siege, which is important because the British need to desperately reinforce Philadelphia with supplies by sea. And they're unable to do that with the fort still under um, Smith's command and control. Uh, they withstand the siege. And there's, there's several epic moments that I found in the research that are they're really interesting. For one, there was a, a British soldier's account of how one of the Patriots' cannon fired a shot from an um, eight-pound gun that, that fired, the, the shot fired about eight, 500 yards, and the ball landed directly into the cannon of a Brit, into the British ship. <coughs> they were able to pull the ball out and refire the gun. <laughs> but it's just it, interesting um, accounts like those that sort of make this book Fascinating. And, and, and Stewart survives Mud Island. Smith practically doesn't. A cannonball from the British fleet goes down a chimney into his, his Smith's quarters and nicks him on the hip and, and, and practically uh, it very severely wounds him. And he's out for the rest of the war. But Jack Stewart continues. And the Marylanders' story continues in 1778 and 70, 77. Washington needs something um, new. They're, they form what's known as the Light Infantry. And hand-picked men from each of the regiments are, are chosen. They're also, they also volunteer for what's known as the Light Infantry. They're known for their sort of athletic prowess, their daring, their courage. Jack Stewart has command of one of these detachments. And um, there's, an, there's a very interesting encounter between an elite unit within the British Army under Simcoe and his Rangers and Jack Stewart and, and, Mer, and, and Mordecai Gist with the Light Infantry at a place in the Bronx. There's a Battle of the Bronx. And it involves um, what I found fascinating about the story is when I was doing the research, there was an account by one of the Marylanders that said several braves were killed. And I had no idea what that meant until I started to unravel the story. And this involves the Stockbridge Indians who actually fought for the United States during the American Revolution. Many Indians did not. But the Stockbridge Indians did, including the chief of the tribe and his son. And it's here. There's an incredible story of the chief and his son actually charge into Simcoe and allow Jack Stewart and several of the Marylanders to escape that day. And sadly, the, the chief is killed, along with his son, in that engagement. And many of the, the, the Stockbridge Indians then, um, they lost many, many of their braves and their, and their uh, warriors. The tribe pretty much goes back towards Massachusetts. They're paid $1,000 by the United States government. And that's pretty much the end of the war for them. But it's not the end of the war for Jack Stewart, who is, leads what's known as the Forlorn Hope. And this is something that the Marylanders do time and time again. And it's called a forlorn hope because it's essentially a suicide mission. The chances of survival are very low. And Stuart is tasked with leading an element of the light infantry at Stony Point, New York. 
and the anniversary of that battle is coming up on July 15th. On the night of July 15th, over a thousand men, including many of the Marylanders, assaulted the British garrison at Stony Point, which bristled with about 19 cannon and about 700 British soldiers. Stuart led the, the forlorn assault on the left flank, which was about 140 men, and the front line of those men were armed only with axes to cut what was known as an atabe. This is sort of like 18th century barbed wire sharpened logs and sticks, and the axe men had to cut through it to make the breach, the initial breach. And they were followed by elements of the light infantry. And what's, it's, it's fascinating, when I was able to piece together the, the pension accounts of this, where I was able to find the men where Jack Stewart assembles them in a field and asks them to volunteer and says that this is gonna be a mission you may not survive. And the men come forward and it's that night they're ordered, the, the officers of the Maryland line and other officers in the light infantry draw straws to be part of the Far Lawn Hope. It's a post of honor. And they, the officers are also issued uh, spears or, um, that basically they're ordered to, everybody's ordered to, to assault with unloaded muskets because they want to maintain the element of surprise. They don't want anybody to discharge their firearms. And if anybody retreats, the officers are ordered to execute a man on the spot with their spears. And this actually happens on several, on several occasions, according to the documents. But they lead the assault, the forlorn hope. They cut through the atavis, and they, they, they storm the fort, and they take Stony Point. And they, they take many hundreds of prisoners and inside of that group of prisoners is a very interesting man. His name is Michael Doherty. And he's one of the last people I want to highlight for, for tonight. And Doherty is a part of the Delaware Blues. He's, from, he's, um, he's in his 20s. He fights at Brandywine, and he's wounded. And he takes the king's ransom. He takes, he takes the money, for, he basically enlists in the British Army because he has a choice, go into a prison ship or join the crown. And it's here that Doherty, Doherty fights for the British. And he's captured at Stony Point, and the, his account is extraordinary. He says that he sees his old men, the ancient men, of the, his ancient friends from the Delaware Blues, who forgive his sins. And he is, once again, he's allowed to rejoin the regiment. <laughs> and he marches with the Delaware Blues and the Marylanders down to the, into South Carolina at a place called Camden. And the Marylanders, once again, are faced against insur insurmountable odds, along with the Delaware Blues. The militia breaks there. And the, the, the Battle of Camden is one of the epic defeats in American history. There's hardly even a battlefield down there. It's hardly marked. It's not even a national battlefield. But um, Michael Doherty is, is recaptured by the British <laughs> and joins, joins Tarleton's horse. <laughs> and he fights with Tarleton. And once again, the Marylanders in February 1781, at a place called Cowpens, are the key to the battle. It's, it's an incredible story where Daniel Morgan comes up with one of the few, few unique tactics of the American Revolution. He puts, it's basically a um, collapsible defense or where a series, he puts, he, he real, recognizes his strengths and weaknesses. He has about a thousand militia who are completely unreliable. At Camden, the militia fled. It was one of the reasons why the men of the Delaware line and, and or the Marylanders were, were imperiled. He recognizes their strengths and their weaknesses, and he asks the militia to fire three shots and then retreat. He positions the, Mel, the Marylanders and the Delaware Blues behind a small, like, hill. And he, 
after they fire their shots, they, they, they push back, and they move through a hole in the, in the line through the Marylanders. The British continue to, to swarm forward in, his, in assault, and they're, to their great surprise, they see the Marylanders and the Delaware Blues uh, in full, fully dressed, firing away. They take out many of the, the rushing British uh, soldiers, and then disaster happens. Um, an order is issued by John Eager Howard, one of the great uh, Marylanders in this book, to wheel right. It's misinterpreted by a Virginian to retreat. So the men actually show their backs towards the British, and they think once again it's Camden all over again. And they, re they redouble their efforts, and they charge further with fixed bayonets, and they come upon the reformed militia who surround them along with William Washington's horse. And it's an, it's an incredible um, victory for, for America at Cowpens. And guess who they encounter? <laughs> Michael Doherty, who once again talks his way out of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of fighting for the British and rejoins his brothers in the, of Delaware Blues. But Jack Stewart's also with him, and he fights through many other battles. And um, it, you know, at Battle of Utah Springs, he survives. And William Washington, who does such a great job at Cowpens with his horse, is captured at Utah Springs, and he's brought into captivity. And much like Nathaniel Ramsey, he's a man of honor. He 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 takes his parole. He doesn't escape. He goes back to Charleston, and he lives in captivity. And it's, it's an incredible story. He meets his, his, his wife there. And um, they, the war, you know, Yorktown occurs, and two years of war continue. The Marylanders are fighting in and around Charleston through this whole time. The war is over, and William Washington is, is, be, is getting married. And there's a, a party for, for William Washington and his new bride. They invite Jack Stewart and many of the men of the Maryland line, the officers that are around, the men that fought eight years of war. Many of these men in a two-year period, two-and-a-half-year period, marched 4,600 miles against the most adaptable army in the world at the time and fought them. Many of them were not paid. For Stewart, it's kind of a victory. He's able to... To, to see his close friend William Washington and see him get married. He's riding towards the, the wedding, and the man that only, you only live once falls off his horse and breaks his neck. This, um, this, is, a, this is a book about the hidden side of the American Revolution. It's about men of honor, family, and fortune. And I wrote this book to hopefully bring them home. Thank you. Take your, happy to take your questions. Obviously, they expanded, but they took a lot of casualties. Can you talk about how they found so many men to come forward and form the new Maryland regiments? This is a very interesting story, um, which something a story that begins as men of honor, family, and fortune, the the richest men of Baltimore, becomes an integrated unit in terms of class and race. And what I mean by that is. It's a, it's a mixed unit where not only the, the elite are, are fighting, but also um, men that are, that are homeless, that are rounded up. In some cases, they don't even want to be part of the army. I, I get into a whole part of that where the, the, sher the local sheriff actually literally finds men that are homeless, and they're rounded up and, and brought into the army. There are also men that enlist and volunteer. It's a very mixed um, an interesting story. But these men, um, there are what's known as levies, where men are drafted, basically. 
as the war goes on. And then you also have volunteers as well. So, and what I meant, meant also by an integrated unit is that seven, the numbers are not known, but there are, is one, um, there's one muster roll that survives, where in 1778, seven to 9% of the Marylanders were actually free African Americans that fought for the Maryland line. One comment and one question. My comment is related to your conversation about the lack of markers and information about battlefields. I visited friends in Toronto, uh, it was about four or five years ago. I learned more from one walk along the Lake Ontario shoreline about the Battle of the War of 1812 than I ever learned 20 years in Washington, D.C. So, you know, that's just my comment. And then, all you're talking about Baltimore makes me smile a little bit because Baltimore is just that weird border city. It's, and I wanted to know, did they have a lot of support for their unit within the city? Because Baltimore, you know, they've turned the cannons at Fort McHenry on Baltimore City several times because of plotting and this and that. So, the, um, I think you make a great point about our, our battlefields. And um, one of the groups that I've sort of say partnered with or, or I support, I should say, is the uh, Civil War Trust. And they have something called Campaign 1776. And their goal is to preserve these battlefields and including the War of 1812's battlefields and pr put up interpretive signs and purchase the land. It's an incredible group. And um, we're working, I'm working with them to put together a team to hopefully find the Marylanders, but also I think that it's a national tragedy that places like Assunpink Creek or the place that Henry Knox set up his guns in Trenton aren't even marked. It's just an empty lot filled with junk. And I mean, these are, these are national treasures. And I, I hope that the book and, and people's interest, you know, turns towards the American Revolution. I mean, it's so important today. There's so much about who we are is Americans come from the American Revolution. It's about American DNA. It's about how we fought. It's about our ideals. It's about our ideas. It all stems from this time period, and that's why I think it's, it's precious and priceless. Yes, sir. Um, I can't remember your rank, Mr. O'Donnell. Wait for the microphone. Mr. O'Donnell, I can't remember your rank. It's a captain to major somewhere in there. <laughs> I've read, I've read your narrative and really enjoyed the book. Thank you so much. My rank was civilian. Okay. <laughs> you seem to be very familiar. Uh, but really I familiar. was in uniform and ended up with, and had an M16. And um, it came through in the book that you and, had And ended up experience. basically, to give you a feel for, I was in um, the first platoon of Lima Company, which went in with 68 men and I was one of 14 that were still standing at the end of the battle. We had five killed in action, including one in front of me that I dragged out with his face blown off against Chechens. So it was a, it, it was a incredibly, incredibly uh, trying situation that in many ways is imbued in this book in an indirect way because this book is not only a conventional war, it's a civil war, and it's also an insurgency. And many of the lessons that I saw in Iraq indirectly are in this book. And I also, it's also about, it's a combat history of the revolution. And I think it's my experiences that allowed me to write some of that because of what I saw. I got the sense after reading your book, I knew about uh, Christopher Ward's I read his War of the Revolution thanks to my brother in high school. I know what he did for the Delaware line, publicizing their sacrifices. You made clear in that book the quality of sacrifice given by the young officers and enlisted men of the Maryland line, and you really dramatized for the country how important those two small states, and they were small states at the time, very, very rural. Baltimore was an overgrown village at that time the sacrifices those men made. And I noticed on some drives to the Delaware shore about 10 or 15 years ago, and I used to go to the beach a lot, when you go by the, all the Methodist churches that are in that area, 
you will see monuments to the officers of the Continental Army who are buried in that church. And you can see they're venerated in that church. And I was on the Robert Kirkwood Parkway in oh. Delaware about 10 days ago. I was caught in traffic on I-95 and I'm familiar with Delaware because my family was in horse racing. And I drove by the track and as I'm driving down the Robert Kirkwood Parkway, the great officer of Delaware who was killed early in the war and I was thinking to myself, does the Vice President of the United States who claims to be Mr. Delaware, does he know Robert Kirkwood from Robert Vesco? And I said to myself, he probably doesn't, which is why we need these battlefields preserved. I've been lucky to visit a lot of them. You make several incredibly good points. One, this is about a small group of men that believe. They believe that they can do the impossible and they do the impossible. And this is a thread in many of my books. Men that believe against whatever, even when everybody else doesn't believe, that they can defy all the odds, and they do. They're able to bend history. Men like Robert Kirkwood, who's an excellent example of, of one of the main characters in this book. Robert Kirkwood fought in over 32 battles in the American Revolution and never re rose above the, the rank of, of captain. But he was an incredible leader. And Kirkwood kept a diary. In that meticulous diary, we know that he mar these men marched over 4,600 miles in a two-year period, many of them barefoot. It's an incredible story of sacrifice. And Robert Kirkwood, it's tragic. He, he, he settles in Ohio, and he, he forms up with the Army again and is, is a, the Battle of Wabash, where Little Turtle slaughters. It's a, an incredible, it's another a defeat of the, one of the great, I mean, in terms of percentages, great defeats of the American Army. It's actually, um, and Robert Kirkwood is, is basically scalped that day and, and left for dead. But it's, it, it's those heroes in here that I, I, I try to, to chronicle their stories. That's what Washington's Immortals is all about. You've uh, provided a very good description of the soldiers and their leaders from the Revolutionary War and the other wars that you've researched and participated in. Do you have any idea as to why other countries are not able to develop similar level of military? Uh, some do, like England. Others don't seem to have very good military. Any ideas? I think it's American DNA. I mean, America is an exceptional place, <laughs> and it's an ex and, the, and the American way of war begins in the French, uh, the French, um, the French, the um, French and Indian War, and it it, exp it exp expands in the American Revolution, where it really comes into. Uh, into light. It's everything from our rule, rules of engagement that are geared to win, uh, use of intelligence, um, understanding that you know you don't just throw people's lives away when you fight. Um, all of, in the, I think the thing that I found so fascinating also was that the ideals of the American Revolution also found their way onto the battlefield, and that is an extraordinary thing. Um, for instance, John Adams' spirit of uh, humanity, where pris prisoners of war were treated properly, and other things. I mean, this is part of Washington's leadership at the top in many ways, and it also is leadership from the Maryland line, where um, prisoners were treated properly. It, 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 but it was also eight long years of war that were very bloody and very long and it wasn't preordained. It's a miracle that we won this war. Yes, sir. You mentioned the prison hulks in uh, New York uh, Harbor several times. Not many people know um, any details about that. What sort of records if any, were you able to find dealing with the prison hulks? There were um, a number of accounts of escaped prisoners or, or, or people that survived that I was able to utilize. But the actual numbers are unknown. And bones were still washing up 
you know, ashore in Brooklyn, uh, you know, even up to 50 years ago or whatever. It's an incredible amount, uh, incredible story. I think one of the most interesting stories that I found it was a it was about a French physician at the British employed to uh, tend the ships, and um, he was actually poisoning our men with arsenic and killing them. That's it, there's the prison ships. I think are an area that I think needs to be more explored in greater detail, and I touched upon it. Um, in the chapter of Washington's Immortals. But it was, it, the, what the suffering that those men went through on those hulks is, is unbelievable. Yes? You, you sir. You, you yeah. hit. I was looking for a microphone. We've got somebody back here first. Um, I can hear we'll you. Get, we'll get to you. I'll next. repeat it. Okay. We'll, we'll get to you next if we, we'll go with this one right here. Okay. Sorry. You, you had mentioned, as I understood it, that much of your information came from pension records? That was a, a, one of the primary sources. What about the women? Where did you get the information? What were the sources for the women? The well, there was a, uh, there was a great uh, biography from uh, Charles Wilson Peale on his, uh, on his, uh, his sister-in-law, um, uh, Mrs. Ramsey. And, and, and we have sort of a the account, some of, several of those accounts come from that, um, and then there's other sources as well. Peggy Chu is another one of the great uh, women of the war that I, uh, I, I, there's some great romances and love, love affairs in the book, and Peggy Chu marries John Eager Howard after the war, and she's a, a beautiful, beautiful woman, and John Eager Howard assaults, they actually, he fights near the Chu House in Germantown, if you're familiar with that. It's this giant mansion, mansion that's um, quarried stone, and at the Battle of Germantown, it became a, a salient point that, that stunted part of the American advance, because the British, a British regiment effectively holed up in the house and, and fired upon our advancing troops, including John Eager Howard. And then after the war, it's kind of interesting. They they have an, a relationship, and uh, he falls in love with Mrs. Chu, and it's a it's an incredible love affair. Uh, John Eager Howard builds a mansion called Belvedere in Baltimore, and they live. Um, he he goes into politics, and you know he's just an, one of the one of the great Maryland, Maryland heroes during the war and after the war. Yes. I, th I think it was in the book 1776, I'd heard about the, the Hessians. I thought they were bayoneting Americans that had surrendered already at, at Long Island. But uh, I was wondering what relationship uh, that may have existed with, be was there animosity between the Marylanders? And it, because it sounded like they would have gotten in front of that. And uh, the second quick question, you mentioned the linkage between the Marylanders and the Delaware Blues. Was there, were there any other groups? Like I always thought Daniel Morgan played a pretty important role in that type of warfare also. Um, yeah, the, um, the Hessians literally uh, at Brooklyn after our guys surrendered, many of them would form rings and then they're, they're with their fixed bayonets and then collapse the ring and just kill anyone inside of it. That occurred at Brooklyn. It occurred at Fort Washington and many other places. I don't have um, any um, accounts per se of uh, total animosity towards the Hessians, but I'm, it's possible that it, I'm sure it probably existed. Um, the, the, the sister or brother unit was the Delaware Blues, and then Daniel Morgan plays a key role in the light infantry, um, and this occurs in the winter, um, February or January 1781, um, where he's he's brought in to take over the flying army, it's called, and this is part of the light corps. That after the destruction of Gates's army in Camden, the Marylanders. Another um, an important point is the resiliency of the Maryland line and the officers. These men are are always there. 
even if the army is destroyed, they're able to rebuild it around this core group of officers and enlisted men. And that's exactly what occurs after Camden. And um, General Green, with the help of Daniel Morgan, who's a legend um, from Winchester, Virginia, and his riflemen, it's Morgan pretty much alone uh, that walks into the area right before the Battle of Cowpens. And according to legend, it's an amazing moment. He, he tells the men that it's, they have to, to fight, basically. And um, according to legend, one of his aides actually lifts up his shirt where he has the count varies. It's over, in some cases, it's 299 or, or 399 lashes and that were, he was struck, he was lashed by a British officer for striking him uh, during the French and Indian War. He was a, uh, he basically had a mule team and he struck this British officer and they, they, they administered hundreds of lashes to him. And it, according to that night, he said, I'm in, I'm a creditor to them by one lash that they missed. And he says to the men that this is, you know, we will either fight or die at Cowpens. And he inspires the men. And he's an, he's an amazing leader um, that brings the militia and the Continentals together and also devises this unique tactic on the, on the American Revolution, which is one of the, the few novel or, uh, tactics of the time which was to, to array his militia up front and the Continentals um, behind and have this, uh, basically a defense in depth. We'll do two more. What qualities of leadership have emerged for you from your studies that mark uh, the leaders of the Maryland and Delaware? I think it's all about leadership in many ways. It's, it's the common thread that, that binds the Maryland line or the boys of Point to Hawk from Normandy together or the first seals or the, the, the Marine Raiders in World War II where they held the line against massive Japanese assaults. It was about people that were willing to die um, for, for, for what they believed in, but also that they put their, they put their men first. They weren't, um, they weren't trying to become, they didn't, their, their end goal wasn't to be promoted. It was whatever was best for the men, and the mission came first, typically. And um, this is something that I saw, that, I, that I've seen in, with the Marylanders. You see it with guys like Len Lamell, who's part of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, that had to scale a 90-foot cliff under direct machine gun fire and somehow take out five big guns that could destroy the Allied invasion, but did it. It's, this is sort of the um, American DNA. This is, a, this is a thing that makes us unique, and, and we see it in the leadership of, of many of these great heroes throughout American history. Thank you.